Hello there, and welcome to today's program. My name is Bayless Connolly, and uh, I've got some answers for you. And it's not because I'm super smart. It's not because I have a corner on wisdom, but it's because I know where the answers can be found. They can be found in the Bible. You know, we, we call these broadcasts Answers with Bayless Conley. But again, it's not because Bayless Conley has all the answers. He just knows where to look. Welkom bij Antwoorden met Bayless Conley. God ziet je. Hij houdt van je. En wat er ook aan de hand is, hij heeft de antwoorden op je vragen. I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I kind of came out of the whole hippie culture. And there was this other kind of hippie guy. He was a little older than me, and he had his guitar case. And I remember he had this big sticker on the side of his guitar case. It said, Answers, they're in the Bible. And I was so struck by that. I actually went out and got a sticker for my guitar case, said the same thing, Answers, they're in the Bible. And I had been looking for answers my whole life, and I finally found where they could come from in the scriptures. And if you were with us last time, I began talking to you about something that is so fundamental, you know, to our lives as followers of Jesus. It's found in Proverbs 3 and elsewhere, but it's really clear here. And it's about trusting or leaning. And I'll, that'll, that'll become clear in the next few moments. But uh, if you were not with us last time, this would be pretty complete in and of itself. We're going to kind of pick up where we left off. In Proverbs 3 and 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. All right? Trust the Lord with all of your heart. The Bible says it's with the heart that man believes. It's with our heart that we have faith. So trust the Lord with your heart and don't lean to your head. Don't lean to your own understanding. When your understanding, when, when your point of view, um, when human logic um, sits in stark contrast and opposition to God's wisdom and what God says, you need to trust God with all your heart, not lean to human logic, not lean to your own understanding. It goes on. In verse 6 says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So whatever you're doing, if it's with your family, your business, for your future, with your health, whatever it is, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. And the Hebrew word for acknowledge literally means to look for and to listen for. So you acknowledge him. I'm looking for and I'm listening for God's wisdom. I'm getting quiet. I'm spending time in his word. I'm listening for his voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. The, the, the sheep of the Lord know the shepherd's voice. So as we acknowledge him, look for him and listen for him in all of our ways, he will direct our paths. And the word direct there, it does mean to show the way to go. It, it does have to do with direction. So he directs us in the way to go. But if you read many uh, Hebrew scholars and, and commentators, they say that the word carries with it the implied thought of empowerment as well. He not only shows us the way to go, he empowers us to walk in that way. And it literally means it carries the thought of removing obstacles out of the way. As we acknowledge him and look for him, he will give us his wisdom, and it may defy human logic. It may fly in the face of human wisdom. But I'm going to trust with all of my heart, and I'm going to do what God says. And as I do, he empowers me, and he also removes obstacles out of the way, making the way smooth, making the way straight. You may have some great obstacles in your life right now. It may be an obstacle of lack. There may be some great obstacles in your family that maybe because of your past, maybe it's past abuse, past hurts. You know, maybe you've gotten into a, to a, a marriage where you're unequally yoked. I, I don't know what the situation is. You know, it, it may be because of poor financial decisions. You, you may have great struggles with your health. What, whatever it is, whatever form those obstacles are, are taking, God has an answer for you. God has wisdom for you. And if you'll acknowledge him 
and, and spend time in his word. He will speak to you from his word. He will speak to you by his spirit in prayer. And then if you choose to trust him with all of your heart and act upon what he says in simple obedience and simple faith and not lean to your understanding, well, you will reap results. Invisible hands will move the obstacles out of the way. You know, there's a grand illustration of this found in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 5, and you probably know the story. I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. It says, So it was, as the multitude passed about him, that is Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he'd stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. What an amazing story. I mean, they've got an obstacle, no fish. No fish, no money. You can't sell the fish. No money, you can't pay the rent. You can't buy food. You can't, you know, take care of basic necessities. And so th th there's a huge problem here. There's a huge obstacle. And the Lord comes along and says, you know, Simon, you know, after he borrows his boat to preach from, says, let down your nets for a catch. Now, in verse 5, we've got Simon's head and Simon's heart both speaking. His head says, Lord, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. His heart said, nevertheless, Lord, at your word, we will let down the nets. You think about the thoughts that would have come through his mind. You know, he would have thought, Lord, we've been fishing all night. We're tired. Um, this is not the time of day to fish. I, you know, I know, we know you mean well, but, you know, rumor has it you're a carpenter. And you're saying now launch out again and put the nets back in the water in the, the hottest part of the day? This makes no sense. Lean not to your own understanding. But trust the Lord with all of your heart. Peter, are you going to trust or are you going to lean? Well, he decides to trust. He says, nevertheless, it's your word. We'll let down the nets. And they caught two boatloads of fish. You see, that, 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 that's how it's supposed to work. This is like, you know, Christianity 101. My mind says this, but God's word says this. I'm going to trust God's word and not lean to my human understanding. I'm not going to lean to logic. Sometimes God's word goes absolutely cross grain of human logic. It absolutely does. I mean, think about this for a moment, just, just by way of another illustration. This is from 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, In the same way, you wives should be willing to serve your husbands. Then even those who have refused to accept God's teaching will be persuaded to believe because of the way you live. You will not need to say anything. Your husbands will see the pure lives that you live with respect for God. That's from the ERV version. But it says, you know, wives, serve your husband. Love him and serve him. Even those that have refused to accept God's teaching, even those that won't listen to God's word, you can win them without preaching at them. That they'll, they'll see, you know, your changed life. Your life will be a sermon. And I know there are some ladies that's like, no, no, that ain't happening. That ain't happening. And you're going to continue to preach to him. You need to be an example of these kids. You need to be in church. You know, you drink too much beer. You know, you just, you, you're, 
You, you, you're lazy, and and what, what about these kids? You, you, you need to take them to church, and they need to see you with your Bible open, and you preach, preach, preach to him, ma'am. I got a word for you. Be quiet. Love your husband. Serve your husband. Let him see your meek and your quiet spirit, and he can be one without you even preaching to him. And I know some ladies say, man, I don't receive, I don't receive None of that, preacher. Now, friend, you got to trust the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. You're preaching at him. You're nagging him to be in church and going after him and telling him what a bad example he is all the time. It hadn't worked, has it? No. Well, here's the scripture. It says you can win your husband without even preaching at him. As he observes the, the change that's happened in you, you're meek and your quiet spirit and your servant's heart. Now, going about things that way may fly in the face of what you think is going to work. It may even fly in the face of your, your, your fleshly nature, because, I mean, you are one that you like to speak your mind, but you need the decision that you're going to, tr you need to make the decision you're going to trust the Lord with all of your heart and not lean to what your head is telling you. You know, it, it certainly, when, when it comes to, to scriptures like that and, and to God's word and trusting his word, we, we need to just go all in. But you know, the Holy Spirit will speak to us as well. And he'll give us wisdom for our individual situations. And I have a friend, he used to work for evangelist Reinhard Bonnke many, many years ago. It's when Bonnke was going full speed, you know, doing the, the, the great crusades in Africa was sometimes, you know, 400, 500,000 plus people in a single meeting. And uh, this was a meeting, I think there was about 100,000 people in it. And Reinhardt's up on the platform and he says, all right, there's someone here named John. John, you need to give your life to Jesus. Now, you think, okay, yeah, we've got 100,000 people. There's only going to be, you know, 20,000 Johns in the, the, the audience. Like, oh, come on. But Reinhardt said later, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, do it. It didn't make sense to me, but I did it. Anyway, my friend is back there, and they've got the counselors, and some of them have large group of people. You know, they're, they're talking to them and, you know, getting literature into their hands and you know, they've got him on all these groups. My friend just felt led to talk to this one guy. And he's, I think the guy was crying. And he says, you know, my mother insisted that I come here tonight. I said, I'm not going. He says, that stuff is so phony. I'm not going. And she says, son, you need to come with me. He said, it's phony. She said, it's not phony. It's real. He said, the only way that I will know that this is real and that God is real and all this salvation stuff you're talking about, mom, is if that preacher calls my name from the platform. His name was John. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You know, when Jesus was at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, you know, the mother, his mother came to him and said, uh, you know, son, they don't have any wine. And uh, then she turns to the, the servants of the feast, says, whatever he says to you, do it. And Jesus, you know, there's these empty water pots there, actually 60, gallon, 60 gallons worth of empty pots. He says, fill them with water. So they do. And he says, now draw out and go take it to the governor of the feast. And so they, they took the water and dipped it out and gave it to the governor of the feast. And I happen to believe it, it didn't turn into wine until it hit his cup. And he takes a sip and calls the, you know, the bridegroom and over and says, hey, usually people um, serve the best wine at the beginning when everybody's well drunk, when they're a little tipsy, then they, you know, serve the, the inferior wine. But you sa save the best wine until now. But you think about the, those servants that had to draw out the water. They had to trust the Lord with all of their heart and lean not to their own understanding. Listen, 
in your situation, whatever it is right now, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through, you, you may be in a great crisis in your marriage. God has wisdom for you. In fact, listen to me. Before the situation you're in ever occurred, in eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit sat down and they talked about you, talked about your situation, and they laid out a plan. God has a pathway for you to walk and he will show you if you will seek him. Spend time in his word. Spend time on your knees seeking him. The great shepherd will direct your path. My friend, he has wisdom for you. If you've just lost your job, God has wisdom for you. You, you may be a refugee that's just come into a country and you don't know what to do. You have nothing. There's the threat of you being deported. There's all sorts of things going on and you just want to see your family taken care of. My heart goes out to you. But your situation, listen, it didn't take God by surprise. He has wisdom for you. If you will seek him, he will show you what to do. Get quiet. Spend time waiting on him. God will speak to your heart. Spend time in his word, and God will speak to you. You know, we am used to it. At one of the old buildings that we were in as a church, we had limited parking, so we had remote parking locations. And, and there was this guy, he'd be out in his yard all the time, you know, watering and stuff. And usually you could tell he was inebriated. He'd been drinking. And as the church people walked by on the sidewalk by his house, he would taunt them. He would harass them. He would yell at them, make fun of them. He was, he was mean. And I'm walking by, he doesn't know I'm a pastor. I'm walking by the house, he says, oh, you're going to that blankety blank church. If you were a real Christian, you'd take my garbage out. So I go through the gate and I get his rubbish bins, his garbage cans, and I bring them out, put them on the curb. I said, there you go, man, have a great day. And he just kind of cursed and I went on my way. Anyway, one of our, our pastors would, would park over there all the time and walk by. And, and God spoke to his heart. You know, the, the, the scripture says this in Romans chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So you, you've got an enemy, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. You, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. And some commentators say that that's like, like you know, burning... Uh, condemnation, if you would. It's, it's burning uh, guilt, you know, for them treating you so wrong and you, you overcome evil by doing good. So anyway, he, would, he just, just was impressed with this and he would always speak to this man kindly when he walked by. And, and the guy would be out there watering. And again, most of the time he'd been drinking even early in the morning. And he, the, the pastor would come and said, man, your garden is beautiful. You, you really have done well with your garden, you know, your roses are beautiful. And the guy starts saying, really? He says, I, I got a garden out in the back. You want to see that too? So he says, sure, and take him out, show him. And he just always compliment him and be kind to him. And then he invited the guy to come to church. And the guy came to church with him one day and I was preaching. And at the end of service, the guy came up, gave his life to Jesus, and he is sobbing. And he remembered when he was taunting me and yelling at me. He says, I didn't know you were the pastor. I'm so sorry. I said, hey, don't worry about it. But here he came to faith in Christ because someone was doing what the scripture said. Now, in your head, you just wanted to ignore the guy. That's sort of what human reason would say. Okay, this guy's been drinking. He's off his rocker or maybe saying something ugly back to him. You know, that sort of human nature. You fight fire with fire. But God's wisdom said, be kind. Overcome evil with good. And so that's what he did. And I think it's important too, you know, that we know the difference between presumption and faith when it comes to this. You know, presumption, you're just doing something because somebody else did it, or you're getting out on a limb and I, I'm going to saw this off and God, you better catch me. No, he's not obligated to, to catch you. But when the word of God has become real to your heart or the Holy Spirit has genuinely spoken to you, well, friend, then you can act on that and there will be results. You know, I, I remember a, a group of people from uh, here from the U.S. went to 
uh, a particular country to work with a missionary, I knew the missionary. And uh, he told him, said, look, you know, don't drink the tap water here. We've got bottled water for you. There's bacteria in the tap water. And there was a whole group of the people that, that were, you know, young, uh, you know, like early 20s. And they were just like, we're a word of faith people. That, that water won't hurt us. And he said, listen, there's bacteria in the water. There's bottled water here. It's one thing if we didn't have bottled water, but we do. And they said, no, it won't hurt us. You know, we're just trusting God. Nothing deadly will hurt us. He said, look, can I take you down to the lagoon? He says, it's full of sharks. Will you swim in the lagoon with sharks? They said, no, we can see the sharks in the lagoon. We're not swimming in that. He said, well, you can't see the bacteria. You shouldn't be drinking the water. But they said, no, it won't hurt us. Well, every one of them drank the water. Every one of them got sick. Again, it's one thing if, if you don't have bottled water. It's another thing if you do. One may be faith, the other quite a bit of presumption. And so don't act foolishly, don't act presumptuously, but act in faith. There is a most amazing story found in 1 Samuel chapters 13 and 14. The Philistines have gathered with, you know, I think a couple thousand chariots, charioteers, and an army like the sand by the seashore. Israel under King Saul when they saw this huge army, the Philistines gather, it says they, they ran away. They were hiding in holes and in caves and you know, everywhere they could to, to get away. They were terrified. And to top it off, nobody had a spear. Nobody had a sword in the land of Israel. They were subject to the Philistines at these times. There were only two swords in all of Israel. Saul had one. His son, Jonathan, had one. So Saul is there. His whole army is fled. There's only 600, you know, Israelites left in the army that have stayed with Saul. And Jonathan actually kind of sneaks off, and the, the Philistines have this big garrison, you know, and this huge, as I said, this enormous army. And it says, 1 Samuel 14 and verse 6, Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these, uns garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. I think that's so important. The armor bearer realized that God had put something in the heart of Jonathan. Jonathan is not just acting presumptuously here. God has genuinely put something in his heart. So he said, do all that's in your heart. I'm with you according to your heart. Jonathan said, very well. He said, let us cross over to these men. We'll show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait till we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we'll go up for the Lord has delivered them into our hand. And this will be a sign to us. And it happened just that way. And Jonathan and his armor bearer went up and they killed a whole bunch of Philistines. And then God sent panic into the ranks of the Philistines. And they began to kill each other. And, and began to flee in, in, in this panic. And then the Israelites, you know, realized what was happening. They began to attack the Philistines and all those that had hidden in the rocks and the holes in the caves came out and they chased the Philistines. And it was a great victory that God brought to them. But it was because Jonathan did according to what was in his heart. It didn't make sense. I mean, you could say, you know, his obstacle was this garrison, garrison of the Philistines and God removed it when Jonathan trusted it with all of his heart. It made no sense to the natural mind whatsoever. And through it, the Philistine stronghold was broken over Israel. Listen, it may seem like the devil has a huge, unbreakable stronghold in your life, over your body, your marriage, your finances, your kids. Friend, you have the sword of God's word. Do what's in your heart and don't lean to your own understanding. Attack that stronghold God's way. Attack your lack with the sword of giving. Attack your enemies with the sword of kindness and with the sword of love. It may not make sense to your natural mind. You may not figure out how it could ever work, but when you decide to trust God with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, when you toss away the toy sword of human logic and reason and take up the two-edged sword of God's word, it sends a trembling throughout the host of darkness because they know 
God is about to start removing some obstacles. Do what God has put in your heart. My friend, you'll not regret it. He will direct your path. He'll empower you. He'll remove obstacles out of the way. He'll send you in the right direction. And I, I just want to close by saying thank you to those that support what we're doing. You know, th uh, hopefully this word has encouraged you. And through your help, we're bringing the same encouragement to people around the world. So I just say, God bless you. And if you've never considered joining us and being a partner, maybe consider it because we want to see other people blessed and encouraged the same way you've been blessed and encouraged by God's word. And I will see you next time. Heeft de preek je aan het denken gezet? Dan hebben we voor jou een gratis aanbod op onze website over het onderwerp Ervaar de kracht van God. God wil je dragen als je zwak bent. Hij heeft de kracht en wil je deze kracht elke dag opnieuw geven. Maar hoe kunnen we deze kracht dan ontvangen? Belus Condi heeft een boekje over dit onderwerp geschreven. Ontdek Gods kracht voor jou. Download het boekje gratis op belus-condi.nl slash kracht en laat God je op zijn schouders tillen. Wil je meer weten en op de hoogte blijven van antwoorden met Belus Condi? Meld je dan aan voor de gratis maandbrief van Belus per e-mail of per post. God zegen.